Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to this webinar on ETFs 101, Fundamentals and Risk. My name is Matt Hogan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here at ETF.com. Very pleased to talk with you today. We're going to cover a lot about the fast-growing phenomenon of ETFs. We're going to talk about what makes an ETF an ETF. We're going to look at the pros and the cons of ETFs. We're going to examine how to choose the best ETF in every single area of the market. And we're going to look at some potential pitfalls and hopefully help you steer clear of the most common mistakes we see made in the ETF space. But before we get to all that, let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture. This is a chart of U.S. ETF assets since the inception of the industry in 1993 through 2014. You can see that year after year after year, money has flowed into ETFs to the point where they, they now control more than $2 trillion in U.S. investor assets. That trend has been accelerating recently as ETFs have come to take a dominant share of the money going into the market from investors. In 2009, for instance, ETFs pulled in more than $100 billion in net new money from investors, even as traditional 1940 Act mutual funds lost a little bit of money. In 2010, that trend accelerated. ETFs pulled in $122 billion in net new money, even as traditional mutual funds lost $237 billion in outflows. In 2011, it was a similar story. ETFs well over $100 billion in inflows, mutual funds losing money. Funds had a good year in 2012, just nipping ETFs for net inflows. But it's important to remember that the mutual fund industry at that time was eight or nine times the size of the ETF industry. In 2013, ETFs regained the upper hand. In 2014, it was a blowout with almost a quarter trillion dollars of investor money moving into the ETF space. In fact, if you look since the financial crisis through the end of 2014, investors had put nearly a trillion dollars of net new money to work in ETFs, even as just $185 billion flowed into the larger mutual fund industry. Why? Well, I think we all know and can recite what people say are the core benefits of ETFs. They're traditionally lower cost than most mutual funds. They're more tax efficient. They offer intraday trading. They're more transparent than traditional mutual funds. And you can use them to access just about any corner of the market. But the funny thing about these core benefits that we all know and can recite is that when you ask investors, why are ETFs lower cost? Why are they more tax efficient? You'll often get shrugs. So that's what we want to talk about today. Because if you understand why ETFs are lower cost, why they facilitate intraday trading, you can also understand the concomitant risks that come with that and know how to avoid them and be a better overall ETF investor. So let's get started. What is an ETF? Well, really, an ETF is just a mutual fund. In fact, it's structured like a mutual fund. It's managed like a mutual fund. It's even regulated under the same general laws as mutual funds. But it's a mutual fund with a twist, and that twist is hinted at in the name. It's a mutual fund that is listed on an exchange, like a stock, and is traded intraday, like a stock. And the fact that these mutual funds are listed and traded on an exchange provides all the core benefits and all the core risks that are assigned to the ETF space. To talk about why that is, I actually want to start out way back in the beginning and imagine that you were creating the very first mutual fund in the world. Not an ETF, but a mutual fund. Let's imagine that you and four of your friends each had $10,000 that you wanted to invest in the market, but you didn't have the time or energy to do it yourself. So you decided to pool your money together into a single fund, a mutual fund. You would hire a professional manager to manage that money. You now have $40,000 in that pool. To keep count of who has what share of that pool, you're each assigned shares. $40,000 
let's say, 100 shares worth $100 each for your $10,000 investment. Now, let's imagine that you hired the smartest fund manager in the world, and they blew the doors out and doubled the money. The net money in that pool would go from 40 grand to 80 grand. Your shares would go from 100 to 200 dollars in everyone's whole. The beauty of this modular accounting system is that people can come and go at any time. If you know, let's say you're that savvy-looking gray suited guy on the left. If you want your money back, you can just send in your 100 shares to the mutual fund company. The manager will go into the market and sell some of the stocks or bonds that they had previously bought. They'll generate $20,000 in cash, and they'll send it to you. You get your money and walk away. All your other friends get to stay invested. It's a win-win. If your cousin hears about the great performance that's been going on and she decides she wants to put some money to work, let's say she wants to invest $10,000. Again, she just sends it into the mutual fund company. It now has 70 grand. It goes into the market and buys $10,000 worth of stocks and bonds, and it issues her 50 shares at $200 a share, representing her $10,000 stake. Now, we all know that's not really how most mutual funds work in the real world. In the real world, you decide you want to invest in an existing fund company that's been around for a while. You want to buy $10,000 of that fund company. You either wire the money directly to that fund company or you go into your brokerage account and enter in an order saying you want to buy $10,000 of that mutual fund. And then what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is nothing. If you place your order at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m., absolutely nothing happens until the close of the trading day in New York at 4 p.m. But at 4 p.m., there's a whole series of things that have to take place. First, you send your $10,000 to the big fund company. They write down who you are and where you live and get your tax information. They look at their fund and figure out how much each share of their fund is worth, its so-called net asset value, in this case, $14.23 a share. They figure out how many shares your $10,000 bought, in this case, 702. They deposit those in your account. They make sure they keep a record of who you are. They fund, send you a prospectus. They staff a phone bank to answer your questions. They hire a fund manager to take your $10,000 and buy the stocks and bonds that you want exposure to. Um, And the process goes on and on. Now, let's talk for a little bit about how an ETF works. If you want to buy an ETF, what do you do? Well, you enter an order in your brokerage account. You say, I want to buy 100 shares of, let's say, SPY, the S&P 500 ETF. Your broker goes and finds someone who's trying to sell 100 shares in the open market. It's priced at $97.23 a share. You send your money over. You get the shares deposited in your account. Everyone's happy. Importantly, you can make this decision at any time during the day. You can buy 100 shares at 10 a.m. and sell them at 12 p.m., and buy them again at 2 p.m. and sell them right before the close at 4. Just as you would trade any individual stock, you can trade these ETFs. Now, if you're paying close attention to this slide, you'll notice that something's missing. The ETF company. In that whole transaction where you bought shares of an ETF, we never once mentioned the company that was running the ETF. Now, you might be wondering, well, How does the ETF own anything of value? We saw in the mutual fund example that you sent your money to the mutual fund company. They sent you shares, but they took that cash and bought securities. How does the ETF acquire those securities? Well, the answer to that is the key to understanding how ETFs work, and it's something called the creation redemption mechanism. For any ETF on the market, there are a series of institutional investors called authorized participants who are authorized to create and redeem shares in the ETF directly with the mutual fund, with the ETF company. The same way you create and redeem as an individual with a mutual fund, these folks do it with the ETFs. But they do it at scale and they do it differently. What do I mean? 
Let's say that an authorized participant wants to create $2.5 million worth of shares in the S&P 500 ETF. Well, every day the S&P 500 ETF will publish the list of securities it wants to own. It wants to own Apple and Cisco and IBM, and it will say the exact percentages at which it wants to own each of those securities in the index. Rather than just sending the ETF company cash, the authorized participant will typically go into the market and acquire those securities in the exact same percentage that the ETF wants. It will then put them into what's called a creation basket, send that creation basket to the ETF company, and exchange, get an equal value in shares in that ETF. The system works perfectly because the ETF acquires all the securities it wants to hold to track the S&P 500, and the authorized participant gets an equal amount let's say 100,000 shares at $25, that's the $2.5 million I mentioned earlier, that they can sell into the market. Now, the exact same thing happens in reverse if the authorized participant wants to redeem shares. Let's say they have 50,000 shares of an ETF valued at $25 a share. They can take those shares and ship them to the ETF company. And in exchange, the ETF company will ship them back a basket of securities worth the equal amount of all the stocks that it doesn't want to hold, all the Cisco, IBM, Apple, etc. And it'll, the AT can then sell those stocks on the open market to balance their book. Now, why do the ETF, AP, why do the authorized participants do this, and why does it matter? Well, in any normal setting, an ETF share will be equal to the value of the securities it holds. But an ETF is traded on the open market, so what happens if there's a massive buy order for an ETF? Well, for a moment, that ETF share price might go above the fair value of what it holds. Let's say, in this case, someone bought a million shares of this ETF. Its price temporarily ticked up to $25.10 and the value of the securities it holds was still only 25 bucks. What, do I, what does the authorized participant do? Well, they see that. They immediately sell the overvalued ETF. They then go into market and acquire all the securities that ETF wants to hold because they know at the end of the day they can turn in that ETF and balance their book. This has the effect of driving down the price of the ETF shares, of pushing up the price of the underlying securities because the authorized participant knows they're going to create that ETF at the end of the day. The AP is able to lock in an arbitrage profit. They sold the ETF at $25.10. They bought the underlying securities at $25. They made $0.10. At the same time, the ETF share price drops back in line with the fair value of its underlying securities. Now, the same exact thing happens in reverse. Let's say there's a massive sell order in the ETF. Someone sells a million shares on the open market, and for a moment, the ETF share price drops to $24.90 when its fair value is $25. Bucks. What does the, EA, the authorized participant do? They buy those undervalued shares. They buy 100,000 shares of that ETF because they know at the end of the day they can send those 100,000 shares to the ETF company in exchange for $25 worth of those underlying securities. They then immediately sell short those underlying securities to lock in their hedge so they're perfectly hedged. And the net result of this is it drives up the price of the ETF shares because they're buying them. It drives down the price of the basket of securities the ETF holds. The authorized participant locks in an arbitrage profit, and the ETF trades back to fair value. That's called the creation redemption mechanism, and it's actually the key to everything that makes ETFs great and everything that introduces risks to ETFs. Let me tell you what I mean by that. When people talk about ETFs, the first thing they talk about is the fact that they're traded. You can buy them like a stock during the day, you can short them, you can trade them on margin. It's tremendous liquidity and tremendous flexibility.
but why are ETFs 25% of all the trading volume on the New York Stock Exchange when closed-end funds, which have been around for many, many more years, represent less than 1% of that value? The answer is that creation redemption mechanism. Because that creation redemption mechanism helps ETFs always trade at or near their fair value, investors can use them in many, many ways to hedge positions. They can count on them when they're buying and selling. Here's a chart of the S&P 500 ETF, SPY, and its indicative value, or INAV. That's a value that the S&P 500 ETF's issuer has to publish every 15 seconds of the day, estimating the fair value of that ETF. What you see here is that the two lines are virtually identical. That's because that arbitrage process is always working. And because it's always working, the ETF is always trading at fair value. And because it's always trading at fair value, traders and investors alike feel comfortable operating with it. And that's why ETFs have become such a popular trading tool. Now, what about lower costs? The average large-cap equity mutual fund charges 1.37%. The average large-cap equity ETF charges just over 40 basis points. Why would that be? Well, the answer is that ETFs cost fund companies less to run, so they charge investors less. Now, there are two reasons for this. One is simply that ETFs are indexed. Most ETFs are index funds, and index funds tend to be lower cost than actively managed products. But index ETFs are cheaper even than index mutual funds, so there's something more going on at work. What is it? Well, remember what happened when you had to buy a mutual fund. You sent your money to the mutual fund company. They wrote down who you were. They sent you a prospectus. They staffed a phone bank to answer your questions. They kept the ledger. They hired a fund manager to go out in the market and use your cash to buy securities. When you undid the process, they did all of that in reverse. With an ETF, when you buy or sell it, the ETF company doesn't even know you exist. They only have to interact on a fundamental basis with a handful of authorized participants. That means less paperwork. It means less work. It means less buying and selling. It means lower costs. And the ETF companies have passed those on to investors. This is something I keep track of at uh, ETF.com. It's the world's lowest cost ETF portfolio. Uh, I created it a while ago. It holds the lowest cost ETF in each of six asset classes, U.S. equities, developed market equities, EM equities, fixed income, REITs, and commodities. This portfolio gives you exposure to more than 4,000 stocks, well over 1,000 bonds, almost 20 commodities, 40 different countries, more than a dozen currencies. It's the kind of portfolio a small institution would have died for just a handful of years ago. And the blended expense ratio of this portfolio is 0.08% per year. For less than 10 basis points a year, you can own a portfolio that would have made a medium-sized institution very happy just a handful of years ago. That's the power of the lower cost of ETFs, which is enabled by that creation redemption mechanism. What about tax efficiency? This is a chart from Morningstar that looks at the average capital gains distribution in active mutual funds, index mutual funds, and ETFs over a five-year period. What you can see first and foremost is there's absolutely no comparison between active products and index products when it comes to capital gains distributions. Index products are vastly more efficient. But ETFs are even more efficient than index mutual funds. And why is that? Well, two reasons. One, the reason that most mutual funds create capital gains is that when one investor decides to exit that fund, the mutual fund company typically has to sell a bunch of securities to raise cash to pay them. So if you and I are both invested in a mutual fund and I decide to cash out, the mutual fund will have to sell a bunch of securities to give me my cash, 
if those securities have gone up in price, it will realize gains. And at the end of the year, it will have to distribute that gain to all the other shareholders who didn't sell out. In other words, because I sold, you'll have to pay a gain. In the ETF example, when I sell my ETF, I simply sell it to another investor. The ETF company doesn't need to know. And because the ETF company is not affected, it doesn't have to sell any securities, it doesn't realize any capital gains. But it's even better than that. Remember when I showed you what happened with authorized participants redeeming shares of ETF? If the share, if an authorized participant redeems 50 or 100,000 shares of an ETF, they send them to the ETF company. In exchange, the ETF company doesn't give them cash. It doesn't go into the market and sell all its securities and pay that AP in cash. Typically, what it does is pay it in kind. In other words, it looks at por its portfolio and decides which securities and which specific share lots it wants to give to that authorized participant. And if it's smart, and most ETF companies are, it'll look at the shares that have appreciated in value and have embedded capital gains. And it'll give those to the authorized participant and say, the tax issue is with you. As a result, ETFs are continuously cleaning out their portfolios of capital gains. And as a result, at least in the equity space, they almost never make capital gains distributions. In the fixed income space, that's a little bit less true. In more complex ETFs, there may be capital gains, but for the most part, they're extremely tax efficient as vehicles, much more tax efficient than mutual funds. Let's talk about the next value, transparency. With most mutual funds, you can only see the holdings on a, uh, every 90 days, often with a 30-day lag. The vast majority of ETFs show their full portfolios each day. The reason they do that is because they have to. If they want to show the basket that the authorized participant has to deliver in order to create new shares of an ETF, they need full transparency. So it's an artifact, a, a, a benefit of this creation redemption mechanism that you and I investors get to understand what we own. And finally, access to anything. This wrapper that ETFs provide is extraordinarily um, uh, flexible. It can hold exposure to equities, fixed income, commodities, currency, levered and inverse products, alternatives. There are more than 1,800 ETFs on the market today. 150 new ones, more than that, have launched in 2015. There are 1,000 more in the pipeline. You can ex get exposure to virtually any country, any commodity, um, any slice or sliver of the market that you want. But before we get too excited, not everything is perfect with ETFs. All of this advantage that you get, the lower cost, the increased tax efficiency, um, the increased transparency comes with a risk. And it's evidenced perhaps best by this chart. This is a chart of the Rydex S&P 500 Equal Weight ETF uh, way back in the original flash crash of 2010. And you can see that it was trading along happily just above $40 a share. And in a, sp a period of about 30 minutes, it crashed all the way down to zero. It then recovered, bounced back, but if you happened to sell during that downtick, you were very unhappy. If you owned this ETF but in a mutual fund format, this red line indicates what your day was like. Remember, mutual funds only price once at the end of the day. Every investor is executed exactly at NAV. It's a much simpler process. The advantage of ETFs is they're traded on an exchange. You can trade them any time during the day. That trading provides great efficiency, great tax efficiency, lower costs. But the challenge to you is you have to understand how these ETFs trade. You have to accept that there are occasional hiccups, and you have to arm yourself with the educational resources to avoid them. The next issue with ETFs that can come up is commissions. Every transaction has a cost, no matter how low, although there's an increasing um, group of commission-free ETFs. And if you're looking at an ETF and comparing it with a mutual fund, you can't just look at the expense ratio and make that comparison. You have to consider the all-in costs. If you pay a commission with the ETF but not the mutual fund, that's something to keep in mind. 
even when they are commission free, you have to remember that ETFs come with spreads. Some ETFs are tremendously liquid and trade at spreads of a penny or less. Some ETFs trade with extraordinarily wide spreads. It makes no sense to save 10 basis points on the expense ratio if you have to pay a percent to get in and out. So look for ETFs that are liquid and trade at good spreads before you buy. Fair value. Most ETFs trade almost precisely at their net asset value. But as I showed earlier, ETFs can get out of whack. For the most part, large liquid ETFs you can trust are trading at fair value. That arbitrage mechanism will be working. But from some of the smaller ETFs, you have to be very careful. One tool you can use is to check the INAV. For domestic equity ETFs, if you're able to access the INAV, you can get an estimate of the fair value of that ETF. For international ETFs, you really have to look to make sure it's a liquid ETF to make sure it's trading at or near fair value. Tax treatment. One of the great things about ETFs is they've opened up new areas of the market like commodities. But you have to remember that commodities are taxed differently than the equities and bonds that we're all used to. A lot of people know about, say, the gold bullion ETF, GLD or IAU, provide great exposure to physical gold. That's great. But the way the IRS thinks about gold is that no matter how long you hold it, it's taxed as a collectible. And that means when you sell it, you'll owe 28% tax. That's higher than the long-term capital gains tax some of us are used to. It's nothing about the ETF particularly that makes this true. The same thing will be true if you actually held a gold bar. It's just because the ETF trades like a stock, most people assume it's taxed like a stock. It's not. It's taxed like what it holds. Finally, there's the issue of choice. With over 1,800 ETFs out there, choosing the right one for your portfolio can be difficult. And it does certainly matter. Now, an easy way to approach this would simply to be choosing the cheapest ETF in whatever asset category you want to look at. Just look at the expense ratios and choose the cheapest one. Expense ratios aren't everything in ETFs, however. What you want is also an ETF that tracks its index well. This is a look at four emerging markets ETFs. You can see their tickers on the left. The expense ratios range from 15 basis points for VWO up to 70 basis points for EWEM. The number next to it is the median tracking difference. This is how far off an index an ETF is over the average one-year holding period. And you can see that even though, say, IEMG is slightly more expensive than VWO, over this studied period, it actually tracked better. Some, most ETFs track extraordinarily well, but it's worth taking the time to evaluate tracking to make sure you're getting the exposure you want. Even more than, ex than the expense ratio, however, it's critical to consider what an ETF holds. This slide looks at the difference between four broad-based China ETFs over a one-year period, effectively 2014. Now, all of these ETFs say that they're giving exposure to China. They all have China indexes, but you can see that one ETF closed the year up 50%, another two closed the year up between 0 and 10%, and one closed the year down almost 10%. Now, if you were going into this naive, you might think, ah, they're all ETFs. They must track perfectly. They do, but they have very different portfolios. The one on the top tracks domestically listed A shares in China. The ones in the middle provide broad-based exposure to China. The one at the bottom, I think, is the largest ETF, but it tracks only um, about 50 or 100 mostly formerly government-owned Chinese mega caps. Those are very different portfolios. You see very different returns. Uh, lastly, as you get into more complex ETFs, you get into some real issues you should be aware of. One that comes up a lot with people we talk to are leveraged and inverse ETF. There are a bunch of ETFs out there that say they provide 200 or 300% of the returns of various indexes, and they do. But they only provide it over one-day periods, and that means that if you hold these ETFs for long periods of time, you can get unusual results. 
This chart compares the returns in the light purple of the Russell Financial Index. In the dark purple, it was an ETF designed to deliver three times the return of that index. And in the green, an ETF designed to deliver negative three times the return of that index. You can see over the period studied that the index is up 11.7%. You might have expected the 3x ETF to be up 35% or more. In fact, it was only up 13%. You might have expected the negative 3x ETF to be down 35%. In fact, it was down 51 Now, there's nothing wrong with this ETF. It's just how compounding works. If you look at an ETF, let's say you had an index that started at 100 and an ETF designed to provide negative 200% of the daily return of that ETF. On day one, the index goes up 10%. 10% of 100 is 10. It goes up to 110. The ETF falls 20%. 20% of 100 is 20. It goes down to 80. On day two, the index falls 10%. 10% of 110 is 11 it falls from 110 to 99. The ETF goes up 20%. 20% of 80 is 16. It goes from 80 to 96. And you can see that even though the ETF has performed perfectly, after just a two-day period, the index is down 1%. You might expect the ETF to be up 2%, but in fact, it's down 4 These levered and inverse ETFs are meant to be held for very short periods of time. And if you hold them for long periods of time, particularly in volatile markets, you can get negative returns that you didn't expect. The same thing is true as you move into complex areas of the market like commodities. This chart simply compares the returns of natural gas spot prices in blue with the leading natural gas ETF in yellow. You can see that spot natural gas closed this period down about 40%, but the ETF closed the period down about 80%. Again, the ETF wasn't doing anything wrong. It just provides exposure to natural gas futures and not spot natural gas. It's not exactly in the fine print, but if you looked at the name of the ETF alone, the United States Natural Gas ETF, you might expect to track this blue line and not the yellow line that you got. In the end, ETFs are enormously valuable tools. If you think back to that broadly diversified portfolio providing amazing exposure for less than 10 basis points a year, you can see the power that ETFs provide. The fact that they're traded on an exchange allows them to be more flexible, more tax efficient, lower cost, and in many ways better than traditional mutual funds. But the cost that you pay for that is that they're slightly more complex. You have to understand how to trade them. You have to understand how bid asks works. If they provide exposure to unique asset classes like commodities, levered and inverse, you need to take the time to understand them. I hope that we've given you an overview of some of the things that we think about when we evaluate ETFs. If you like more information, we have a complete guide that provides detailed analysis of each of these phases of the ETF and each of the things you should be excited about and the things perhaps you should be concerned about. ETFs are institutional quality tools made available to all investors. If you understand how to use them properly, you can build amazing portfolios, and I hope that you do. For now, this is Matt Hogan, the CEO of ETF.com, thanking you for listening to today's webinar on ETFs 101, fundamentals and risk. Happy investing, everyone.